but actually the man himself, Hugh Killen, uh, the chief executive of AA Co, he joins us now from Brisbane. Hugh, uh, great to speak to you there. Now, Dorothy McKellar's, uh, uh, Dorothy McKellar's uh, Australia threw it all at you, didn't she? It certainly has, Tiki, and thank you for having me. It's been a um, it's been a, a fair old ride for the last year. We've had mm. we've had we definitely had the drought impact, and we've had the floods as well. And at one point there, to be honest with you, we had a fire in one of our properties as well. So I thought I was getting the trifecta there for a while. Yeah, I mean, look, you're not an agribusiness guy. You're a banker uh, who's had a, a, got a bit of uh, shit on his boots, really, because you come from a, a pastoral background, I know. But you're not an agribusiness guy. How did you handle this onslaught? Um, I think you go back to first principles, uh, Tiki, when you're dealing with something like this, which is, you know, you take your time, um, understand the issues that are ahead of you, um, rely on your team. I have an extraordinarily good team as well. And then you just play the ball that's in front of you and, and work through, you know, one issue at a time. Um, the drought, as you know, has been something that's been with us for a while now, whereas the, the flood was something that happened very quickly. So you need yeah. different sets of skills to deal with both. And, um, you know, it's just about being considered and thoughtful. Yeah, oh, we're looking at some of these horrendous pictures uh, right now. I think it's 43,000 cattle uh, gone and your people were up there very quickly. Just take me back to those few days. Yeah, Tiki, um, I think we spoke just, just as it was happening. It was, uh, it was a horrific time. I was actually at a... Uh, and an event in Bangkok with the uh, Crown Princess of Thailand when I got the call that it was a, uh, it was a, a, a bad situation and worse things. So we were back, back as quickly as we could have been on the ground and uh, literally um, faced with um, uh, high winds, very cold temperatures and this huge body of fast-moving water um, over you know, almost 800,000 hectares of our property. It was quite a confronting scene. Um, and especially, you know, getting down on the ground and seeing the cattle that were impacted and, you know, working with our people that were at the coalface, it was, um, it was quite a horrific um, situation. Now, you say that your strategy has actually saved the company in these conditions. Why? So, Tiki, our, our, our strategy is around selling um, branded beef around the world. So if you think about AACO, now we're transitioning and being a, being a food business. And so the impact of, um, of the drought and, um, and losing animals in the, uh, in the flood uh, is lessened by the fact that we actually have a closed supply chain uh, and we're not having to sell those animals live. So we take the animals that we have in our feedlot street through to um, our customers all around the world. So when you look at our statutory numbers, which are a reval of our herd, um, that doesn't hit us because we're not selling those animals. We're selling them as food and meat around the world. Yeah, and, and as you've said, I think, it, you know, it could have been a lot worse because not only did you uh, put the, the, the new abattoir on ice, effectively it is now, um, but also you um, basically closed the, the 1824 uh, branded, uh, branded beef, didn't you? That supply chain. Yeah, both of, those, both of those decisions have proven out to be um, uh, very timely and quite fortuitous for the business, uh, especially that 100-day program. If we'd still had those cattle, they would have predominantly all been in the Gulf and the impact could have been, um, well, would have been absolutely horrendous. And uh, so, because we didn't have those animals exposed um, and we haven't been actually carrying those animals across the organisation, that's, uh, that's been a positive for us. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, simplifying and making AACO a more efficient operation is at the heart of our strategy. But, you know, really taking our cattle all the way through to high premium branded beef around the world, really that's the basis of the strategy. Uh, and neither Livingston or, or, or 1824 are playing into that. So it's actually made us, made it's, it's helped us weather that storm. Right, you know, so you're putting your cards on, on Wagyu. Uh, now, Wagyu cattle largely weren't there, uh, you know, in these enormous properties underwater, were they? No, it was uh, actually the, the, the air in the Gulf that went underwater was where our breeder herd is for our composite animals. So uh, it has a small impact on our F1 program, but uh, our, our core asset, our, our core Wagyu herd, which grew 3% year on year in spite of the conditions that we've been in, really pleasingly, it's our core asset outside of our land and people, um, uh, was, was largely immune from the, for, from the flooding event. Right. What about the sort of costs going forward? You mentioned that, of, of course, you're, one of your big breeding herds has now been hit. Uh, how do you replenish that? And what about the infrastructure challenge up there? Yeah, so there's a couple of questions in that. The first one about uh, replenishment of the herd is, is our herd 
Um, we, were, we were actually restructuring our herd anyway off the back of the decision not to supply 1824 beef. So mm. we've been running that cow herd off and actually um, culling into that more heavily than we normally would do. Uh, and so uh, in some ways, not that you'd ever want this to be the result, the, the flood actually has expedited that. So we can manage through that. Um, and that's why we're talking about the fact that it'll have no near-term impacts to supply, especially in the Wagyu business, where for the next couple of years at least, those cattle already on feed in feedlots were down in background and country in central Queensland. Um, in terms of infra infrastructure costs, we put between six to eight million dollars aside to repair um, our golf properties, and we're thinking through how we do that now because we don't want to set them up in the same way. It's an opportunity to reset what we do up there and think about doing things differently. Mm. You said, in a way, it was almost uh, the flood pushing you through, uh, you know, to forcing you to, 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 to fast-track this strategy, if you like. I'm wondering as well whether things like the rise of the vegans uh, here in Australia now too, and also this growing uh, backlash against uh, live export is also pushing you into the strategy that you've already set. Absolutely. You know, um, when we think about dining preferences, and I think the vegan piece of that's a very, very small um, part of the market, and to be fair, on a global basis, it hasn't changed that much in terms of consumption, um, right. albeit it's definitely um, uh, noisier. And obviously there's a changing opinion in terms of sustainability and, and, and climate change, and that's going to buffet agriculture more generally in Australia. So um, all of those things we deal with um, in terms of being a, a, our sustainability policies at AACO, but as we think about branded beef at a higher margin to global markets, even if you're selling less of it but at a higher price, that plays straight into our strategy. So absolutely being premium, um, leveraging the beautiful and um, unbelievable assets that AACO's got, it actually helps protect us and that's the core of our um, branded, premium branded beef strategy, our global strategy. OK. Uh, look, just a question around your big shareholder, of course, uh, Joe Lewis, who, who owns Spurs. He's got a bit of a game against Liverpool, I think, on June the 1st. Uh, but he, he and, and you have been doing, through his company, uh, a series of joint ventures. Uh, Donald McGecky, your chair, has presumably been driving that as well. Now, th th there have been questions around disclosure here. You've put out a press release on this to the ASX. Um, what are these and should there be more disclosure? on them. Yeah, Tiki, um, we've obviously put out a letter today in relation uh, around these, uh, around these um, related parties. Um, firstly, what I would say is the most important thing for me as a CEO is to make sure we follow all of our disclosure obligations and reporting obligations properly, and um, absolutely that's core to what we're doing here. Um, and the other piece is as well is that we are absolutely at the forefront of innovation in agriculture. And, um, you know, from time to time, time we make uh, small investments in companies that can help transform not just AACO but agriculture more generally. And um, the nature of some of these investments are they're not material in terms of um, uh, investment dollars. Uh, and a lot of them are actually quite commercial uh, in confidence in terms of the type of work that we're doing around that space. But if I give you an example, um, in one of the companies we, we, we disclosed in the letter today is a, a company called Atlas. And, and when we think about ear tags, for instance, we could actually be putting a huge amount of money into the um, uh, ear tags companies that are out there now are trying to think about how do we build some of that capability ourselves and actually get that equity carry in it as well. So there are very valid reasons for these and not material to AACO um, and as, as you'll see in our accounts today they're fully disclosed.